It's October. Welcome to the Teens Cornerstone Connection lesson. This month, we begin a new quarter with the theme Bible Reality Bible. We have our mission coming from Shani, Joyce appealing to the deaf community. We have Amy and Sid on violin and piano. And then we'll have Steve, Flex, and Ashley and our wonderful teen teachers on the panel. Enjoy. Um, hi everyone, my name is Shani and I'll be giving the mission story. So our mission story comes from the country Cameroon and it's about a little boy called Elijah. And the title of our story is Hearing a Voice. So one evening, father asked the seven-year-old Elijah to massage his neck and shoulders before going to bed in Cameroon. Father's neck and shoulders often ached and the massages helped him relax and feel better. Elijah liked helping father and he often gave him a massage before bedtime. The light bulb in the living room was dim and Elijah couldn't see well, so he ran to his bedroom to get a flashlight. Just as Elijah entered his bedroom, the light went off. It was dark and he couldn't see anything and he felt a strong wind blowing through the open window. Then he heard a voice, Elijah, 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 the voice said. Elijah didn't recognize the voice. It wasn't a man's voice, it wasn't a woman's voice. It seemed to be a man and a woman's voice mixed together. Elijah was scared. He stood still as a stone. He wondered who was calling his name. Slowly, not too softly, not too loudly, he asked, Who is it? He rep the voice replied, It's me. But Elijah didn't know who it was. He was so scared that he forgot to pray. Then he heard another voice. If you can't find the flashlight, come back so we can pray together, the voice said. It's getting late and you need to go to bed. Elijah knew the voice. It was his father. He stopped feeling so scared. At that moment, the lights came back on. Elijah looked around the room and immediately spotted the flashlight on the floor, covered by a shirt. He grabbed the flashlight and returned to the living room. It's too late for a massage, father said. You have to give it in the morning. Father didn't notice that Elijah was especially quiet as he prayed and Elijah didn't tell him about the voice. He didn't think father would be interested. Climbing into bed, Elijah felt a little afraid. Then he remembered Psalm 23, and he repeated from memory. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointed my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Finishing the psalm, Elijah fell asleep. He slept peacefully. The next day, Elijah told mother about the voice and she immediately prayed with him. Lord, she said, you're the one who knows what happened. You are the one who knows the voice that called Elijah. I want you to cover him because you, the solid rock, stand against any spirit who doesn't honor you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Elijah knew that the voice would not call his name again and it hasn't. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a Seventh-day Adventist school in Elijah's home country of Cameroon, where children will be able to learn about God. Thank you for planning your generous offering.
to you, our viewers, and a big hello to you, my panelists. So today we have a very, very interesting lesson right before us. So take a deep breath wherever you are because you'll need it. So before we begin, I'd like my panelists over here to introduce themselves, starting from my far right. Hello, fellow viewers. My name is Mikhail Flux. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve. And I am Ashley Silas. And my name is Bridget. I'll be the moderator for today. So before we begin, I'd like to invite Flex to give us a prayer. Let's bow heads for the prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask for your Holy Spirit as we go through, Lord, this topic, this lesson, O oh, my Father, this day. And oh, Lord, we ask, O oh, Lord, that you may show us what you want us to speak and understand, O oh, Lord. And for the fellow viewers, may they understand the concept of what you have to show uh, through this topic, O oh Lord. Give everyone here a blessing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Flex. So today our lesson is entitled Eli's or Ellie's, I don't know how you want to pronounce it. Eli's Bad, Bad Boys. And this is a very interesting story because I just want you to think with me. The reason why God actually kept us or brought us into this world is because he wants to repopulate heaven. So one way in, in which he'll repopulate heaven is for people to come to earth, to be born, to, for their characters to be formed, and then if they're found right, then they can get to heaven. Now one of the key things that we'll be discussing in this lesson is the role of parenting in the lives of children. And so I want, I want us to see what do we think about this lesson. So Flex, maybe you could take us through that. All right, so I'll start with the key texts for this lesson, and it comes from 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 12 and it says Eli's sons were scoundrels they had no regard for the Lord we have two verses the second one is Proverbs 22 verse 6 and it says start children off in the way they should go and even when they are all old they will not turn from it Amen. now I have, a fellow, I have a few questions that I would like my fellow panelists to answer now I'm going to give you four authoritative figures or role models in a normal uh, person's life. We have a teacher, we have a role model, we have your parents and your friends. Mm -hmm. Now, Ashley, let's say from the ages from your born till you're eight years old, how important, if you could rank them from top to least, are these four uh, people? Okay. Um, from ages one to eight, mostly it's parents. Like seven, eight, there is when the ch children start telling their parents, but the teacher said so. <laughs> but like from four years, five, six, seven, they go like, no, I cannot do that. My mommy did not say like that, mm, you know. Yeah. So for them, it's just parents, then teachers, then their friends. And when it comes to their friends, they'll be like, but my mommy said this is how we, we do it. And like, no, but my daddy said, oh, no, my daddy is stronger than your daddy. So <laughs> at that point, just their parents and yeah. then their teachers, then their friends. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is very, very true. Uh, Steve, I'll give you a different age set. From 9 till 15, how important are these four authoritative figures? From 9 until 15? Yes. I would still put the parent on top, mm -hmm. definitely, because... From the ages 9 to 15, the, the, they're still learning, they're still discovering, you see. And uh, without the help of their parents, really, they cannot uh, find them. They cannot discover themselves as a person and all that. Um, I drank teachers again second, mm -hmm. because they are fundamental in their learning, their understanding also. True. And then uh, friends can come after, you know. Yeah. They, they have more time with their friends, actually, at this age group. Yeah. But uh, I still put parents, parents as the most important. Mm -hmm. It, that is authoritative, but if you look at who we listen to most at that age, we'd rather listen to our friend. That's, our true. Friend. That's, That's right. also true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so for the last eight set, I'll give it to teacher Bridget. And this is because none of us are 25, so <laughs> maybe you can expound which are the most authoritative from top to least. So at least from experience, I would say um, as you're transitioning from teenage into adulthood, then you start realizing that your parents have so much value because you realize that in teenagehood, that's when you are not agreeing with so much of what they were saying. 
But when you get into your adulthood, then you realize, wow, they had so much wisdom. What they were telling me is making sense right now. So for most, truly, it still goes back to their parents. Yeah, so it's like you start with your parents, you go to other people like your friends, and then you go back to their parents. So that's what I would say. I would, I'd rank parents first. And then there's also a big role that friends have to play during that age group because you realize that um, uh, friends will advise you in different roles. So youth also consider friends really great. And the third one I'd give is role models because this is also a time when you've, you've known yourself or you're getting to know yourself better. So the people who you look up to will have a very big influence on your life. Thank you very much, which is so true. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're going to go into the Sabbath section, and I'm going to ask Steve, which stage in life is the most critical for character building in a person's life? For character building? Yes. I'd say probably teenage, teenage, teenage? years, mm -hmm. because at that point, they're trying to discover who they are. You see, and they're trying to discover themselves in a whole. So I think that's probably the most important age. And if they don't get it right at that age, it won't be easy going forward mm -hmm. to discover themselves. And I think I'll them. disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And not entirely, because that is when you also need to make choices for yourself. Mm. But the most critical age group for character building is from 0 to 12, okay. just before your teens. Mm -hmm. In that age, if your parents do an exemplary job, you will be like um, Joseph and Moses. Mm -hmm. You know, they left their father's house at 12 years of age, right. and they knew what was right, and they would not do otherwise. Mm -hmm. But you get to teenage shoot, at least it happens in our day and age where we get to teenage shoot and we throw everything our parents have ever taught us out of the boat. And they're like, you know what? I want to live my life. Right. I want to do things how I think I should do them. Mm -hmm. And now you get, like right now, you're now an adult. I think everyone on this panel is an adult. And you start looking back at the things you've done when you were a teenager and things you did when you were a child and you think well when I was a child and my parents were basically controlling everything mm -hmm. I was far much better right. than when I was a teenager and I was making these decisions for myself and going against the authority right and so yeah the parents always remain whether you've grown up married not married parents will always be at the center of authority yeah, and I'd just like to add that it's also important to note that as a child is growing from age zero, their brain is developing so quickly. So it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like a sponge where they absorb everything around the environment. So it's very important for us at those early formative years to, to ensure that there are walls. We are preventing, you know, evil things from getting into them because those things will really influence them. Maybe not at that time, but you'll see the effects later on. Yeah, which is very, very true. Now maybe the last question, I'll just throw the answer or give it. It says, what are some of the examples or ideal training? For the verse says, start off a child in the way they should go or train up a child in the way that they should go. Um, some of the kind of trainings I think about is maybe punishments like, you know, or you take away their phone these days. Phones are very important to kids. So or maybe discipline them in, you know, a beating with uh, a wooden spoon or a muiko, you know. Yeah, so these are some of the trainings I thought about. It seems like every one of us has had to go through that phase in our lives. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and now that we are talking about parenting, maybe let me just hear from our panelists. Um, having grown up to this age that you are, do you think that your parents or your guardians did a good job? Or what, what, would you, what would you say they did? Was it good? Was it bad? Do you regret? Is there anything you would change as a parent? Uh, I can start off. For me, yes. I think my parents did the best of their ability to build the character I am today. Yes. Because they were more of strict when I was young. But then they kind of let me see for myself or test the waters for myself. <laughs> and then once I came to realize that, hey, you know, it's, it's bad here or you know, what my parents were saying, then they f started giving me advice, and I feel like they really did the best they could, you know, to their ability. What about you, Steve? Well, I believe my parents did very well. Yes. They did great. 
um, holding me to the person that I am today. Right. Uh, mine was more of practical, so right. I got to see things <laughs> firsthand. Right. And uh, I can say that helped because growing older, you get to experience them again. And right. since you know what happened to you initially or you know what you were told about it, right. you're able to do the right thing. Uh, you're able to understand, like, you need to do this Decent. when this happens. Right. So I believe they did very well. Mm. And, uh, they've helped me grow to the man I am today. Absolutely. And actually, before you answer the question, I want to add a spanner into the works. Considering that you're a firstborn, who has seen maybe, I don't know if your parents' leniency has <laughs> increased as the other children have increased, but what would you say about that? How has the parenting been uh, for you? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> when, okay, my parents, growing up, like toddler age up to 10, 11, 12, my parents were strict, mm -hmm. like inapproachable light. <laughs> you do not even cough. Mm. Like, my parents were strict to the point of you can be seated in church, you cannot even drink water during the service. <laughs> you want to drink water? Get out. <laughs> Go, stand at the door, drink water, come right. back. Mm -hmm. That was my parents. Yes. So, my brothers came along. And they were a bit lenient with them, but mm -hmm. for me it was very strict. Mm -hmm. And then to my teenagehood, I was scared. Like, I've grown up very scared of my parents. They say, turn left, you turn left, even if you're going to break your leg. <laughs> you can hear their voice anywhere left. you go. <laughs> yes. So, as I approached teenagehood, mm -hmm. I was very scared. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I would never, ever talk to my parents, no matter what it is I'm going through. They just say, turn left, you turn left, whether you're going to die when you turn left. That's mm. it, die in obedience. But I was <laughs> so scared. So because of that, I, when I was 14, I sort of rebelled. Mm. I was tired. I was tired of this pretentious obedience where I just turn left and turn right, right you turn right. right. Go straight, you go straight. Mm -hmm. And so I messed up a lot. I did bad things. I, they tell me turn right and I look them in the eye and I turn left. <laughs> You know, yeah. so growing up, 15, 16, I started realizing that as much as their method of parenting was wrong from mm. the start, it was also, was also not right to rebel. Mm. And then I started seeing that some of the things they said initially now make sense. They do make sense. Mm -hmm. And so 17, now I've turned 18, I am more uh, of agreeing. Like, sometimes I sit in my mom and I'm like, by the way, mom, you said this sometimes back now, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, even right now, she tells me something, actually do this, and I'm like, mom, I can't, I'm not doing it. She's like, okay. You will come back to me and tell me, no, tell it me. makes okay. sense, mom. <laughs> I told you so. I told <laughs> you so. Right. Or you told me, mom, and now I understand. Yes. So, right now, I'm more open-minded to what do you have to say? And even right. when I'm making decisions, I'm like, mommy, what do you think? Because I find that she has lived in this world for some time, mm -hmm. and I am just venturing into this world. Mm -hmm. Therefore, her experiences may be very, very valuable to me. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. And I think we have gotten a few insights from each one of us. I think it's very important for each one of us to be grateful for the role that our parents have played, especially considering the Bible says that we should obey our parents, but it doesn't end there. It says that you should obey your parents in, in the, the Lord. Lord. So it's important sometimes even to question, maybe why am I being told to do this? Yeah, Or why am I being told not to do this? So it's important to question for you to have an understanding of that. Now there's a, a, a short story that is given in our lesson about a little boy. This little boy had a toy boat, so he was he had gone to a place that had a pond. So with his toy boat, he decided that he's going to place it in that pond. And as he placed it there, he imagined um, it being a big ship and that it would, you know, float and overcome all those waves. So as he was imagining, he came to a realization. When he came back to real reality, he, re he realized that his toy boat had gone so far from the shore of the pond. So he became so worried. And then there was a man who was seated just beside, it was like a park, so a park with a pond. So he seated beside and he saw the frustration of this young boy. And he asked him, would you need some help? And the boy said, of course I would need some help. I love my toy boat, I'd really love to have it back. So the man said, okay, I'll help you. So what he did, he went to the other side of the pond 
and he started throwing stones. Now the little boy got so mad because this was a new toy and because he saw that those stones were so close to hitting his toy boat. But little did he realize that by this man throwing the stones into the pond, it was making ripples that would make the toy boat go to the other side. So the little boy was telling him, stop, 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 please don't, you're going to spoil my toy. But he, he didn't understand. But later on he realized, oh, okay, the toy has come back to the shore and I can go and pick it. And so I just want us to apply that in our lives. It's, it's like what our parents do for us, as we have discussed here. There are some things that they do to us that we feel like they're painful for us when they're disciplining us. Just like how this boy felt that his new toy boat would have been destroyed because this man was throwing stones. Yeah? But you realize that the stones did not hurt the toy boat, neither did they hurt the boy at all. So discipline for us sometimes may be painful, whether it be from our parents, from role models, or from God but it is worth it in the end. Yeah, so that is our, um, the little story that I just wanted to add into this. Now I'd like to request Ashley to take us right into our story for today. So Ellie's sons, this comes from First Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, 22 to 25, 27, and then 30 to 36. Mm-hmm. Ellie's sons were scrundles. They had no regard for the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, had about everything his sons were doing to Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate and intervene. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? Mm. His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Therefore the Lord God of Israel declares, I promised that the members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me, those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house, so that no one in need will reach old age, and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family will ever reach old age. Mm. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength, and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow, before him for a piece of silver and for a loaf of bread and plead. Appoint me to some priestly office so that I can have food to eat. Amen. Thank you so much for taking us into this story. And I just want us to reflect on how this story begins. They say that now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And actually Belial, if you go and look at its meaning, it means worthless, people who are worthless. So you can imagine these are the children of a priest and they're being called worthless. And it goes on to say that they knew not the Lord. Now I want you guys to to think with me. Is there a difference between knowing the Lord and knowing of God? Is there a difference between knowing the Lord and knowing of God? And can you relate it with our story for today? Maybe one of our panelists can... Um, mm-hmm. Yes, there is, I'll say there's a difference, a real, real difference, um, because knowing God can just be something you've heard, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think it's Job where it says, I heard about you, but now I have seen you face to face. So you can hear about God, but you cannot actually know him internally, like um, firsthand. And why I say this is because uh, even the demons know that there is a creator mm-hmm. and that Jesus is Lord over all. Because when he was casting out demons, like the story of Legion, um, they said, uh, Lord, Lord, do not cast us away from this land. At least send us to the pigs. Mm-hmm. They already knew that he is 
the Lord over everything. So there's a difference between knowing and having a first-hand relationship. relationship with him. And thank you so much for reflecting that. Actually, if you look at our story, it's as though the sons of Eli, Eli just knew of God. They knew that this, yes, he's a powerful God. And as a family, we have been appointed to be the priests and so forth. We're supposed to be conducting these sacrifices. But they did not know God. They did not have a personal relationship, intimate relationship with the Creator. And that is why they ended up doing these grave sins that they had. And so maybe, Ashley, you can take us through the, into the, out of the story. But before you do that, I think I just uh, came across a paradox when I was reading this story. Eli was a priest, and other than that, he was also a judge. He was not only a priest, but he was a judge. But how comes he was not able to pass judgment upon his own children? So you can imagine, that's quite a paradox, I thought. Anyway, Ashley, you can take us through the out of the story. Um, turns out that... It's, the, it's not the only paradox. Mm -hmm. Samuel. Mm -hmm. mm. Samuel was a judge and a priest mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Samuel, his own children mm. were corrupt, taking bribes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Perhaps it's not even our place to correct our parents. But mm -hmm. sometimes you get so absorbed mm. in your duties to the world, your duties to the church, right. your duties to your family that you forget to take care of your own children. Mm -hmm. You forget that, you know, they need to be told, turn left, turn right, mm -hmm. this is the wrong path, this is the right path, and sometimes even given reason for it. Mm -hmm. um, Could I add something before you even, just from what you've said, um, it's important, actually, Sister Ellen G. White in the Spirit of Prophecy says that the home is the child's first school. It's like God has put parents as his representatives here on earth. So it's in quote and quote, it's like the parents are the first God of the child before they actually know the true God. So if the parents fail in reflecting the image of God, then the image of God is completely marred for those children. Mm. Mm. Completely so distorted. Add also. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, the parents, like the, those who are in high positions, right. like being a priest, like let's take Eli, for mm. example. Mm -hmm. He had such an important role to perform, you mm. see. And probably he may have not understood that uh, he's, he'll be held in high scrutiny. Because when you're, in a, when you're in a very important position, people right. pay high, hold you in very high scrutiny, mm -hmm. you see. And uh, so, you see, even uh, I also read from the spirit of prophecy that right. uh, he was held in high scrutiny and also his kids did not perform the right duties. Mm -hmm. And this had an effect on many people because he had charge over many people. Mm. So if we understood that, that would happen, that his children might have influenced a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Maybe, then maybe he would have uh, brought them up better. Right. You know, that speaks directly to us who are seated on the panelists mm -hmm. because, on the panel, sorry, because we have our, our lives to live and there are people who know us virtue of what we are doing now mm -hmm. and they will meet us one day and be like, really? is this the same you? I mean, yes. if Ashley is doing that, then what about me? You know, mm -hmm. so um, the question I'd ask is what part of this story challenges our view of God mm -hmm. and our view of spiritual leaders? Mm -hmm. Flex, what do you think? Ooh, what? Repeat the question one more time. What part of this story challenges our view of God and our view of spiritual leaders? Well, you have to be... The challenge is discipline, right? Mm -hmm. Most spiritual leaders don't really have the... They don't really understand, or maybe the challenge is discipline your own flock. Mm -hmm. um, an example I'll give is David and Absalom, right? When the brother, I forgot his name, slept... Amnon. Huh? Amnon. Amnon, yeah, slept with Tamar, right? And Absalom heard about this, and he plotted to kill uh, Amnon. But if David had responded sooner and disciplined Absalom then they oh and disciplined Amnon then Absalom wouldn't have the need to actually seek out his own justice mm -hmm. so 
that's the real challenge that the spiritual leaders actually need to understand that disciplining is not hating your flock. It's, it's something that is necessary for growth because even us we are chastened in the Lord mm -hmm. so that we are refined as the outcome of the product. Amen. Um, who are the main characters mentioned in the passage and what are some of the weaknesses this story exposes, Steve? Uh, some of the main characters um, are mentioned too, Eli and Eli's sons, basically. And some of the weaknesses exposed here is our main theme, mm -hmm. which is poor parenting mm -hmm. and uh, failure to discipline, you see. And uh, these weaknesses turn out to be grave because God uh, punishes the Israelites and punishes the sons of yeah. Eli as well. And uh, this causes very a lot of distress and it even leads to, the, to their death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I will answer this question. Mm -hmm. What do I you think it means when the Bible says that Eli's sons had no regard for the Lord, mm -hmm. and how would this story look like today? Mm -hmm. You know, we often say in teens class that we should do the things that we only do if we would only do if God was there. Mm -hmm. But we fail to say that God is there. He is there. there. Not if he was. <laughs> because he is always he is. there. Mm -hmm. Seeing our every thought, our every motive. And having no regard is, you know, when you would just do something wrong, like you're just blunt about it, you're mm -hmm. not afraid of the consequences of whoever is watching. And if you look at the things they did as priests, sleeping with the women who were serving people at the tent of meeting, mm -hmm. it was not a slight scene. But the rumors, their father knowing, and everyone else knowing did mm -hmm. not stop them. It did not even make them shrink. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that God knew. But starting off the children, training the children in the way that they should go, also played a big role. And in the flashlight, I think Ellen White says that if we do not restrain or if our parents indulge our every need and our every want, then we get to the point where we do not know how to control even ourselves right. at a personal level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just also want us to discuss, you've said that um, in that question, the Eli sons had no regard for the Lord. What would this look like for us today? And I'll just give one example. It is very evident, even in this day and age, that people would actually come to a church, maybe not even necessarily our church, but in any church, and they just be on their phones throughout. And it's not that they are writing notes or reading the Bible. In fact, the sites that they are on would just make your jaw drop. So, you know, that's maybe an example. Do you guys have any other examples? How is it that people in this day and age have shown that they know not the Lord like the sons of Eli? Any other example? I don't know, but mm -hmm. the example that you've given is really, really disturbing, especially mm -hmm. for us teenagers, because we come to church and our gadgets are on all through. Mm -hmm. And the things that you're doing are not worth, like, I would not even mention it. Exactly. It is just too bad. Yeah. So it's an appeal to every one of us. I mean, we need to have that... Um, what I call a belt of conduct. Mm -hmm. You cannot go below that line. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Even things such as making noise in church. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing about making noise is that it not only affects you, it affects the people around you. So it's like you're preventing other people from listening to the word of God. And even as Ashley has made the appeal, it's important for us even to see the dire consequences that it had on the family of Eli. He was told that, you know, the people of your family will not live to an old age. Can you imagine? And in fact, the, the role of priesthood was taken away from their family. So it was a very, very grave thing. And for us, we may not see the consequences right now. You may come into church, do what you want to do, go home and you're like, after all, see, I'm still alive and I'm still coming to church every day. But remember that the wages of sin is death. So it's at the end that you will receive and reap those consequences. So let's all be alert. Let us change our ways because that is what God is calling us to do. Amen.
And so I'd just like to invite um, Flex, having taken us through the key text, what appeal do you have to make to us? No, mm -hmm. I will really, based on what we've learned today, on 1 Samuel 2, 12, where it says that Eli's sons were scoundrel. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, it's, we see this from the, prof, the spirit of prophets, prophecy from Ellen G. White, where it says that Eli's, the problem with Eli's son was a gradual and continual rebellion that went unchecked or eventually spun out of control. Now, Hophni and Phineas served as re religious leaders but were openly belligerent, belligerent and careless about the calling. My appeal is if you know anyone in your family or in your friend's circle who's going through this rebellious stage or you see them doing something that you know will eventually hurt them, pray for them. And we are here to be our brother's keepers. It's always good to care for others even though they seem or they say they do not need it. Prayer can go for anyone. So if you have these friends, you can nudge them and always keep them in prayer so that God can change their hearts and open their eyes to see that they're actually going the wrong way and that they need to come back to God because it's just as simply as turning around. That's all you need, to turn around to God and right then and there, you will be saved. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Steve, how about you take us through what Sister Ellen G. White has to say in Patriarchs and Prophets? Yes, so uh, this is highlighted in the flashlight, mm. which reads that uh, there is no greater curse upon households than to allow the youth to have their own way. When parents regard every wish of their children and indulge them in what they know is not for their good, the children soon lose all respect for their parents, all regard for the authority of God or man, and are led captive at the will of Satan. Well, this is highly illustrated when... Uh, Eli, when Eli did not correct his sons, mm. you see, and if you read further into that chapter, uh, in Patrick's Prophet, you'll find that uh, eventually their sons, the hearts of their sons were hardened, mm. would be sons were hardened. Mm -hmm. And eventually, even when he tried to correct them now, yeah. mm -hmm. they did not turn back, they couldn't go back. Because they were too far into sin right. that they couldn't correct they couldn't see any meaning into what on what their father was telling and then i also presume that they were so used to their father giving right. them everything or allowing them to do anything that they want mm -hmm. that at this point they're like uh what 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 is this old man saying mm -hmm. uh, you know mm -hmm. they they i'm sure they even reached the point where they, they were mocking him at some point right. you know i'm wondering like it just hit me that apparently we somewhat in our mind, think that when our parents give us everything we want to, we'll respect them. Yeah. Mm. Like, if my mom says, Ashley, don't do this, I'm thinking, no, mom, this is so unfair. You know, I'm mama and all that. Mm. But it builds the respect. And quite on the contrary, if she gave me what I wanted, every time I wanted it, I'd, I'd lose respect, I'd lose soundness of, this is authority, mm -hmm. you know? And it also applies in the world in terms of workplace and now you're working right. and you need to listen to people. For them to, I mean, you, you come into an industry when you're a child and there are those seniors and they're leaving and they need to hand over their responsibilities to you. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you listen to them? How do you interact with them? to show, to go to the point of showing that it is true you can handle these responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Or do you act like Hoffney and Phineas where you abuse your authority and abuse your power right. and do whatever it is that is pleasing in your sight? Right. Yeah, thank you. So from the flashlight, I also got two questions. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask, uh, let's say, Flex and distribute each of the questions. So the first one is to Flex now. Do you know anyone uh, that's not your parent who uh, adopts like the youth, start provoking new things when correcting their children or something like that? Pardon, who does what? Who like is taught, who thinks about it? Who thinks through something when mm -hmm. they are correcting their children? Who thinks through something yes. when they're correcting their children? Yes. So let's say, let me understand if they, the... they adopt a thoughtful approach. Oh, a thoughtful approach. Yes. 
Uh, oh, very, very few. Actually, I, I don't, I can't bring anyone in mind. If I'm <laughs> no being one honest. comes to mind. No one, no one comes to mind. Okay. Most of people um, go straight to judgment and feeling like they don't love me or necessarily I, they don't want my happiness. So I haven't yet found uh, someone who actually just says, you know, hey, maybe my parent has something for me to learn from her mm -hmm. saying no or him saying no. Okay. Okay, that's from like the child perspective, but how about like the parent perspective? You know, sometimes I think that um, as much as our parents think, uh, our parents feel like we are disobedient, they also just don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same problem. Right of not listening when they're speaking, but our mm. parents do not listen. Sometimes you would expect that, okay, fine, there's a rumor that is going on that I have done one to three things, mm. but my mother should know me well enough, mm -hmm. well enough to tell me, by the way, I had this, but I don't believe you can, do, you it. can do it. <laughs> or even though, yeah, it's possible that I can fall into sin, but, there are just some things that you're like, Mom, really? Me? You could even believe such a thing. <laughs> and you know, for, as a person, that really hurts me. Right. That you do not know your child that well. Right. You do not know me that well. Mm -hmm. To the point of believing a stranger over me. Right. And sometimes the situation is just more than you can explain. But mm -hmm. your parents are like, no, you explain it here and now. I want to know. <laughs> and perhaps you're even traumatized though you're like, what? I... I really don't know what happened right now. Mm. Yeah, so okay. that's just one thing I think we mm. should know even as we grow up. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So, Teacher Bridget, your question was mm. uh, what five qualities mm. would you want to have as a parent? Oh, wow. Um, first of all, I want to be able to reflect the image of God. Mm. That's the first one. I want to be a good listener. Now hearing it from Ashley, because yeah, it's important that parents also listen. Mm -hmm. I want to be prayerful for my children. Because you know, as a parent, you can tell children to do this, but they do the opposite. So there's a role of prayer there. I also want to be a disciplinarian. And I know I will be because of the kind of personality that I have. Uh, those are for um, the fifth one. Okay, the fifth one will come later as I continue growing. So and thank you so much for that. Which one do you think would be the most difficult? I think being a disciplinarian is difficult <laughs> because even as Eli did, you know, he felt he felt really bad because that was one his public image would have been destroyed if he if he told his children that you know you guys can't take up this role, you're not yeah. doing the right thing. So one would have been his public image. And the second thing would have been, he, he just, you know that feeling as a parent, you're disciplining your child, but you're like, oh no, what, what will they think of me? Will they still love me? So I think that one is challenging, yes. I think okay. parents don't have that feeling. <laughs> like Maybe become a parent, you. then you will know. Yes, so we need to come to an end. So I'll just request um, Steve to take us through Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, mm -hmm. as Ashley is preparing to give us just one verse from the punchlines that spoke to her, then we will come to a close. Okay. So I'm going to take you through Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, which says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Mm. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much. And as Texas speaks to me is, fathers do not embitter your children or they become discouraged. Personally, growing up, I really loved this text. <laughs> Even when my parents would go like, please share with us your favorite text in the Bible. I'd be like, Dad, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, fathers, do not express your children. And my dad would be like, why do you do that? I'm like, because you make me annoyed so much. <laughs> Mm. So, it is just something that I think we should adopt in our day-to-day -day lives. Mm. And even as we grow up, and if we will become parents in the future, um, shouting at your children is not the best thing. No, <laughs> matter, no, matter, how, no matter how upset you are. Mm. And you can be a disciplinarian, but you can also learn to listen to your children. They mm. will know. You know, Mama, you, you just don't pass that line because... Mm. 
but they are just those things that we will need to understand because our society is becoming degraded and everything is a disaster. In our generation, everything is a disaster. Everything. I cut myself, it's a disaster. I'm going to sleep <laughs> for three days. Mm. My youngest brother, he's cooking in the kitchen. The knife cuts him. Yeah, my chiapo. Yeah, lijikata. Yeah, meda kulala. Because it is a very big disaster. But if I did that, I mean, you'd not be eating every day. Right. You, I, I mean, every, like twice in a week, you'd be sleeping hungry because you're sick of me lijikata. So I'd, I'd say that we will, we need to be to learn to put the importance the adequate importance on important things mm. and the adequate lightness or trifleness on trifle matters so that we do not make a big deal of something that is small and that which is serious and for our eternity make a trifle I Amen. think we can close that. Amen. Thank you so much. So I want to remind you people that it is charged upon you. If you have the responsibility of correcting a sin or rebuking or reproving and you do it not, that sin will be charged upon you as if you are the one who had committed. So it's important for us in whatever capacity we are to correct whatever sin we see even if it is amongst our friends, be the one to call out that sin. Don't let that sin grow to a point where you cannot correct that person when their hearts have been so hardened. So thank you so much, our panelists, for joining us today. I'd like to invite Steve to close for us in prayer. Okay. So let's believe and pray. Our Father, what in heaven, we come before this day, thanking you for the blessing that you've given us to discuss your word today. I pray that you may be with us and be with those with our viewers, O oh God, that you may enlighten them and they may walk in your path, O oh Lord. Be with us, O oh Father, protect us. For this is my humble prayer, believe and trust in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.